Hi everyone, I'm Professor Sarah Rankin and I would like to welcome you to Imperial COVID-19 lockdown lessons. Today is lesson four and we're going to be hearing from Professor Stephen Riley, Dr Caroline Walters and Dr Lucy O'Kell. And we're going to be hearing about how they've been using different approaches to model the spread of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So as always, um, please have Mentimeter.com open in a web page ready for the quiz. And anyone that hasn't used this before, you don't actually need to register or sign anything for this. You just go to Mentimeter.com in the web browser and then um, at the top when the page opens, it says enter code and we're going to give you that code. So um, and then you can do the quiz for free. So just um, to let you know. Um, and we've got Margarita here again, so she will be um, looking for your questions in the chat so that we can put some questions to these guys at the um, end of their presentations. So um, let's get started and we'll go straight over to you, Stephen. Thank you very much. Um, I was uh, I was just trying to figure out the slide control there. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so firstly, I um, I have to make it clear there's three of us here today and we're talking about a few um, little bits of work from a very large effort by a large number of people. Um, the photo here on the right shows a group of us a few years ago at one of our away days um, and there have been up to I believe 60 or even 80 people at any one point in time um, within our department Imperial actively working on these different analyses um, of the to help support the COVID-19 response both in the UK and in many different countries around the world. And um, we're supported very generously by a number of different funders, um, especially J-IDEA, the Abdul Latif Jamil Foundation and the MRC, uh, the Medical Research Council in the UK. So uh, it's very important that we always acknowledge the, the support that lets us um, do the projects that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and start a little bit with a with a general motivation and then I'll explain one of the kind of results that we had very early on um, as an example. Um, can I just go um, back one slide please Sam? I'm struggling with the, uh, thank you. So it, at one of these meetings, um, one of our outreach, we were uh, one of our away days a few years ago, we were thinking about how we can best um, kind of communicate what we do in some sense when we study different pathogens and think about them and what one of the things that we remembered was these playing cards which used to be very popular in the day of you know and iPads and, and and phones are not quite so popular now um, but the the aim of the game here was that um, the cards would each have one example of a, of a of a tank or a wild animal or something like that and you would all collect the cards and then you would try and compete against each other by saying well I've got the heaviest shark or I've got I've got the heaviest animal or I've got the fastest animal and then whoever had the the, the biggest or the fastest or the the highest killer rating um, they would win cards off the other people and you'd, you'd play out till the end of the game they were the popular brand name was called top trumps um, and they were great for teaching people about stats and giving you a kind of intuitive background and they also showed how um, it's when you think about biological systems and you think about how we have to interact with them and possibly counter threats from those systems, there are certain key properties of, um, uh, of elements of these systems that are much more important than others. And we kind of thought, well, that's kind of a neat way of looking at the world. Um, and in some ways, that's a little bit like um, what we do. So I'm going to go for a single click now. So. This is kind of, here's an example of some of these cards. We actually had them made and we give them out when we do outreach. And what we try to do um, is think about all these different pandemic threats that there might be and, and think about the key characteristics of those threats. And I'm not gonna go through all of them individually on the, on the slides today, um, but later on you'll hear about R0, the basic reproductive number, um, and you'll hear about the percentage of cases that die or the infection fatality rate. So those are examples of the type of things. And in some ways, the last five months for us has, has been about working with scientists around the world, finding the best possible data to put together the best, the most accurate 
picture of this new virus, the key characteristics of the new virus that we need to know in order to be able to better combat it. So it's a, um, that's a kind of a, a slightly simplistic way, but it really does explain the, the importance of the things that we do or the order that we do things in. So moving on to the, the current outbreak, this is um, taken from uh, the Japan Times, um, which I saw through a tweet on the 15th of January. Um, and the picture is not of Japan, the picture is of, uh, of um, a shopping, uh, a hospital parking lot in Wuhan, or actually, my, sorry, that's the market in Wuhan. Um, and the story was about the second exported case. So, um, there had been one case already exported to Thailand and then had someone had tested positive for this new virus. And the second case was exported to Japan. Um, they don't remember having visited a market. Um, they had returned home to Japan a few days before this and they'd already recovered. And the really worrying thing at that point was that we may be facing some version of SARS um, that may have a lower infection fatality rate and in some sense, because it was more mild, there's a risk that it may be harder to find and it may pose more of a problem than SARS had done um, those years before. And just for a couple of minutes, I'm gonna take you through the very first thing that we did. And before I go into this, and this, this forms report number one. If you go to our website, you can look, I think we're up to about 28 or 29 reports now. Um, and many of these have, report, have are, are been submitted as papers or have appeared as, as peer-reviewed papers as well. Um, but this is the first one. And the techniques, the, the computational and mathematical techniques in lots of these papers are pretty sophisticated. We try and use the best techniques available. Um, but what I want to share with you today is the first thing that we did, which was really a pretty straightforward calculation um, to try and figure out what the total number of cases might have been in Wuhan at the time that these first few exported cases were being picked up. Um, and this is the this is the one table um, from that report. Um, and the calculation that it shows on here is how, um, and, and there was another exported case the next day. So by the time we actually release this, I think the 16th or the 17th, um, when it was actually released, there had been three exported cases. Um, so uh, working um, um, in, a, in a small team for this first report, we saw uh, that we managed to find data on approximately the number of international travelers leaving Wuhan each day. We made some assumptions about the total size of the population from which they would be leaving. And then we figured out from what we knew about SARS, kind of how many days we'd be able to detect them if they had been infected. Because if they traveled after they stopped being infectious, we wouldn't have seen them. And if they traveled before they turned infectious, we wouldn't have seen them. So we needed those three bits of information, those three assumptions. And then quite simply by just combining those numbers to get the probability of picking up a case as an exported case, we could reverse back to the to our estimate of the number of cases in Wuhan at that time. And our estimate was around 1700. Um, and at the time, the Chinese authorities were reporting 41, not necessarily because I, I hasten to add that they were hiding anything, um, but they reported only the cases they had tested and confirmed and were seeing as severe cases in the hospital. So um, we felt this was very useful at the time. And in, I'd highlight, but I won't go into details, we also gave really good confidence bounds, which is slightly more complicated than just the arithmetic. Um, but we made an assumption about the distribution from which this these counts would arise. And we showed even the lower bound of our of our confidence interval was substantially higher than current reported numbers of cases. Um, and that was that that was a very useful result, generated a lot of interest um, and, a, and a lot more attention, both attention both here internationally and within China. And um, don't want to take up too much time, um, so I'm just going to make a few general comments because I know part of this is to um, is not just to give results, but try and explain, give a bit of a flavour about how we do this stuff. And this is a slide I use to say, if, if you've got a um, an interest in maths and computers and a passion for biology and health, then there are lots of great things that you can do. And what it will often revolve around is 
quite a bit of coding because that's how we do maths these days most of the time so you'll spend you know we spend quite a bit of our time looking at code designing it getting calculations from it and then top right is a picture of uh, me and members of the team in the field because we often go out to look at where we're gathering data during non-pandemic times and then the rest of the time is you're in meetings and this is a picture of uh, a few of us at a, at a meeting in Geneva a few years ago so the actual day-to-day -day life is kind of coding visiting field sites and then um, you know meeting with colleagues and trying to figure out what to do I think the last few comments that, that I'd make um, just to say that we come from a large mix of backgrounds um, so uh, you need a you need a passion for the different elements of of the type of work that we do um, my I did standard kind of science a levels and then I did physics I had a wayward couple of years as a management consultant um, and then I did computer science and, and disease modeling um, I've really enjoyed my career so far I've been with Imperial College a lot of the time but I also spent six years um, just after SARS working at Hong Kong University um, so you do get the chance to, to work in different places as well so I think that was the the last of the slides I was going to share so Sarah should I hand back to you now yeah so um, if I've Ooh. got this right oh no you're back Ooh. to that I did forget, so I think I was going to do the Mentimeter. Sorry about that. Should I um, should I just move on and do the Mentimeter quiz as well to set it up yeah, for later sure. on? Sorry, Sarah, I forgot about that coming next. So if you remember looking back at the um, one of the characteristics that we track for these different pathogens um, is the percentage of cases that die. And, and what I wondered, given that has been a, a, a big part of the story of COVID-19 of SARS coronavirus 2, um, what we've done is hopefully if Sam has got that up, we've set up a Mentimeter um, question um, where we'd like you before we go on with the rest of the, the presentation to think a little bit uh, to, to try and answer the question. Um, what do you think the, uh, the percent, the proportion is um, of people who die once they've been infected with the underlying virus? Um, you hear two things quite a lot. You hear SARS-CoV-2 and that's the name of the virus and you often hear COVID-19 that's the name of the disease if you actually get sick then you're a COVID-19 patient so Sam at, um, at this point there everyone's off doing their um, uh, doing the Mentimeter um, do we just give them yeah. a moment to do that yes give them the moment do, do you want to um, Go on to the if you go on to the next slide, then we should be able to get the results. Got it. OK. So people, yeah, everybody just go on to your um, go on to menti.com and uh, type in the, the code. OK. So we'll give uh, hopefully you have got a device to hand and you can have a go. Um, we, for those we know there are quite a few more people watching than uh, have managed to key in at the moment but so Stephen uh, uh, just tell while, while we're waiting for those results I know yeah. you're sort of a keen cyclist have you been managing to keep any of that up during what do you, do you cycle on a track or what's your sort of um or so are I, you, do, uh, I do yeah I do a bit on the I, I like to do road cycling and um and I've done uh, I've done a little bit, not much. I, there is a virtual uh, road cycling thing called Zwift, um, which I've been doing for quite a while. Um, and in the in the kind of very early days of the lockdown, when we were really encouraged not to to risk kind of crashing and going to hospital, um, I did do quite a bit of uh, virtual racing on Zwift, which is uh, it's nice. It's like uh, it's a it's kind of like Mario Kart on a bike, um, but without the. Uh, the but same you're thing. actually is that a fitness thing? You're not just doing it with your with your thumbs. <laughs> No, it's actually you've got to. Uh, it measures the power from the stationary bike, feeds it into the computer, then it does a whole virtual world with other people. It's uh, it, uh, yeah, it keeps so me. Do you, uh, keeps do you me normally up. race? Do you race or do you just? Yeah. Just, uh, okay. No, they have the racing's really good. It's very easy. Um, so uh, and it's 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 a really good workout, and you don't and then you really you don't have to worry about crashing, which is if any of uh, people watching actually occasionally do race a, a bike. The, the downside there is the actual crashing. So. OK, so I think we've got a good, good, good number of people who have replied now. So yes. have got it right. Um, I think that I will leave it to uh, to Lucy to comment on later, but I think there's a lot of people in the right range there. Yeah. OK, OK, so we're going to come back to that. Um, 
Right, so um, thank you, Steve. So Steve's been spending his time in lockdown just because he wants to complete his set of top trumps. So he's just sort of here <laughs> doing all these calculations so he can come up with that final um, top trump card for, for SARS-CoV-2. Um, um, right, now we're going to hear from Caroline. Um, now, Caroline's a mathematician and she's also involved in uh, modelling the spread of the virus, but she, she uses quite a different approach to Stephen from what I gather. And um, yeah, she's, she's not doing it through computational um, analysis. And actually, I'm really interested to hear from her because in her backstory, I gather that she did a PhD in something which is called anthropology and maths. And I'm really intrigued to find out what exactly that is. So Caroline, just tell us a little bit about you first. Hi, thanks, Sarah. So yeah, for my A-levels, I was fairly similar to what Stephen had done. So it was maths, further maths, chemistry and psychology to me. Uh, rather than physics uh, and then I went on to do a maths degree at Durham Uni um, and that was the first time I ever saw maths being used in any way to describe things in biology because I did a course called mathematical biology. Um, mm. At the end of my degree though I didn't know what I wanted to do uh, but I saw an advert for something called a PhD in anthropology and maths and I didn't know what anthropology was <laughs> but um, from my A-levels, you see that I did psychology. So I quite liked doing things about human behaviour. And actually anthropology is kind of the study of human behaviour. So what I ended up doing for my PhD was looking at how behaviours pass from person to person. So we learn from each other. So how these behaviours spread through a population, um, similar to the way an infectious disease could spread through a population. So that's what I did there. And I think the key interesting thing is that the maths that I use to uh, model the spread of human behaviour is the same maths used to model the spread of infectious diseases, which is how I moved into working in mathematical models for infectious disease spread. OK, so that's um, interesting. I, I mean, I'd never have thought that sort of existed as a discipline and and I think we have been sort of saying this um, in quite a few of the other talks we've seen people um, doing interdisciplinary um, work but usually sort of within the sciences so maybe maths with physics or um, engineers with uh, biologists so it's interesting to have a sort of subject that is more you know social sciences rather than um, just straightforward sciences. So, um, well, moving on, tell us then about, you know, how you've been approaching the the COVID-19 or SARS um, cov 2 infection spread. Oh, I seem to have lost the slide control. OK, I think Sam, Sam's around. He's going to sort that out. So you went to um, Durham, you, en you enjoyed that. What what then brought you to, you came, yeah, what brought you to London? Did you just see a, a job advertised and it sounded interesting? Uh, yeah, so first I went to Salisbury, actually. Oh, okay. I moved from Durham to Salisbury for a job with Public Health England because mm -hmm. the job was advertised and that's where it was. Okay. Uh, and, um, um, and what sort of led you to coming to London then? What was the main sort of impetus for that? Yeah, it's interesting how people, I mean, as scientists, we move around a lot. Um, you, you know, it's like anything else. You can um, obviously look for job adverts and you'll see, you know, if they want a mathematician, you could end up working in many different areas. Um, but the other great thing about being a scientist is you can work um, in other countries very easily. So we have, as you know, a lot of our um, students and, and people that work at Imperial are international and ourselves. We, um, for example, I spent three years living in California um, in my early 20s, um, being a scientist and enjoying California. So, yeah. So, uh, Caroline, have you uh, managed to get control of your slides again? Hi, yeah, apologies for that. My internet is showing that it's very unstable. So 
okay. we'll see how we go. Yeah, very quickly, I actually just thought I'd show people a little bit of what it meant to do research in mathematics, because that might be something that people don't understand, because we don't do experiments like you might do in the other sciences. Um, so for my PhD, what you end up doing is you write something called a thesis, which is a really long report of all your work. And here's a little section from my thesis. And when you do it in maths, I actually didn't do my work on a computer at this time. It was all pencil and paper. And the way you write it, you end up with lots of sentences written in English, followed by equations. Um, but what I thought might be interesting to show you all, I've highlighted some bits because they might be familiar to you from your, maybe say you're doing A-levels, it might be familiar from your maths A-level. So on the left-hand side, I've circled the E brackets T. So that's saying E is a function of T. And the next equation down you'll see is DE by DT. And some of you will have studied differentiation. And that's all I've done there. So it's a rate of change. And also on the very bottom row, some of you will be familiar with the integral sign and doing integration. And what I've been doing there is using integration by parts. So I really just wanted to highlight that the stuff that I learned during my A-levels, I was using eight years later doing a PhD because that's how maths tends to work. You just learn more and more stuff and it builds on what you've learned before. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk to you about a very important number in epidemiology, which is called the reproduction number. You might have heard about it in the news called the R number or sorry, I think it's just, yeah, the R number. Um, and this is a way that we can measure how a disease is spreading through a whole population. So, for example, a disease spreading through the UK. So if you see here, I've said let let the reproduction number be two and I've taken my first infected person over on the left hand side and then they go and spend time with their friends and family and we expect that they will infect two more people. So there is a new generation of infections which now has two infected people in it. Those two infected people, they go on to infect two more people and now we have four infected people and that goes on to eight infected people. They infect two, so we get 16, 32. And this number keeps getting bigger and bigger. And this shows that an infection is spreading and we're having an epidemic. Um, but a thing to note about the reproduction number is that it is an average. Could I have the next slide, please? So here I've said, let the reproduction number R equal 2.6, because actually there's no reason for it to equal a whole number. In reality, a person can only infect one other person or two other people or three. You cannot infect 0.6 of a person, but we're taking an average over the whole population. What this also means is that even with our reproduction number of 2.6, we could have somebody like person A, now they've gone on to infect five other people and that's bigger than 2.6. Person B is infecting two and person C doesn't infect anybody, perhaps because they stayed at home when they were sick and isolated. But again, because we're taking an average, these details don't matter to us because we're looking at things on the whole population level. Next slide, please. So then we get an interesting situation where what happens if the reproduction number is less than one. So again, if we look on the left hand side, we've got four infected people. But what happens in the next generation? Well, if R is less than one, we think that there's they won't definitely infect one more person. If R was 0 0.5, we could say that for every two infected people, we'd expect only one of them to infect one more person. So we can see here that we started with four infected people. That top person went on to infect nobody else. And that chain of transmission, so passing on the disease person to person, has ended because no more people get infected. Whereas the second person down, 
they did go on to infect somebody else and then that person infected somebody else. But then again, we see the infection dies out and they no longer infect people. So this is what happens when an epidemic is dying out. Um, so R less than one is a situation that we would like to be in with coronavirus because that means people are not continuing to get sick. So next slide, please. So R becoming less than one can happen if we let the if we let the disease spread through the population and did nothing. Eventually, everybody in the population would have become sick and people would have maybe become immune from diseases and that's why they stop spreading. But the problem with letting that happen is that at some point, lots of people get the disease at once. And for some of those people, they get so unwell that they have to go to hospital and some of those people will die. And we want to avoid that. And that is what's been happening in the UK with the coronavirus outbreak. So the other way of making R be below one is for everybody to change their behaviour. So firstly, we have lockdown. I've put here isolating. So everybody is staying at home as much as they can and they are not seeing their friends and they are not seeing their family because then if you are infected, you're staying at home. So you're not meeting other people. So the number of people that you can infect, it won't be anybody if you're not meeting anybody. Therefore, the average number of people that you'll infect has got to be very small because you're not meeting anyone. It doesn't quite go to zero though, because we can't all stay at home and not go out because we need things like we need to go and get food. Some people have to go to work to keep the hospitals running. Some people are ill with other diseases and have to go into hospital. So that means when you do go outside, we can look at keeping our distance from people. So with coronavirus, you can catch that disease because one person who is sick breathes out and they breathe out little droplets and the virus lives in those droplets. And then you would breathe those in and that is how you could get infected. But if you stand far enough away from that person, those droplets never reach you. So you can still talk to them, but from a distance. So at the UK at the moment, the advice is to stay two metres away from other people. Um, the other way you could get infected is through your hands by touching things. So if you've touched something and get the virus on your hands and then you touch your face, you could become sick that way. But if everybody is washing their hands more frequently and very thoroughly, that reduces the chance of that route of transmission occurring. Next slide, please. OK, so then we come to how do we as epidemiologists calculate this number R? And that can be quite difficult. It would be really good if we knew whether everybody in the UK right now was infected and then we'd want to know that information tomorrow and the day after and the day after because we'd want to know how that changed through time but we can't know that so we have to look at what information we can get and one of the things we can get is the number of people who are dying from coronavirus every day and then we assume that if every day the number of coronavirus deaths is going up that represents the disease going up, number of people with the disease going up in the population as a whole. So if it's going down, sorry, if the deaths are going down, we then think that the number of people in the wider population with the disease is going down. And this is reflected in the number R. So we take this data of the number of deaths and we put it into our mathematical models to get an estimate for the reproduction number. But because I've said that the data we're getting doesn't actually definitely tell us what's happening, we have what we say is uncertainty around our value for R. So we never report R as a number. So we won't say R is 0.73. What you'll see is that we give a range. So I've given an example here of R could be between 0.6 and 0.9. And we could be very confident the R was in that range and that is more useful to say the government 
then if so if we said we are 95 percent confident that r is 0 0.6 to 0 0.9 that is much more useful than we are 20 percent confident that r is in between 0 0.7 and 0 0.71 because they have a greater certainty that it is below that threshold of r being one uh, i think that was my final slide there great thank you um Caroline, so it's really interesting how you're doing this by actual sort of what I would think of as sort of traditional sort of pen and paper maths. When you're doing it now, do you do that on a computer or, or do you actually? So now that I work with infectious diseases, I do more of my work on a computer. Um, but mainly that's because other people many years ago already did a lot of the pencil and paper maths. So what we do is we use their work and then we implement it by writing computer code. Right. OK, well, it's great. And, and thanks so much for that really clear explanation about the R number that we've been hearing a lot about in um, the last months. Um, so now we're going to hear from uh, Lucy. Uh, Lucy is a lecturer in the Department of Public Health. So all these guys are, are based at Imperial in the Department of Public Health. Um, Lucy has been looking at how death rates are being calculated in the UK and around the world and why it's important to monitor these, which I think um, Caroline's already um, touched on because that's our sort of handle to getting into this uh, R number. So over to you, Lucy. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm just going to talk a bit about the work we've been doing since January on the coronavirus. Um, so as you've heard uh, from Stephen and Caroline already, um, there's been lots and lots of activity in the department. Um, so in January, like everyone else, we um, and, and even December, we began to hear about the new coronavirus in Wuhan. Um, and it soon became clear that it was spreading uh, outside of Wuhan. Um, so this is really to tell you a little bit of um, how we began to work out um, what the virus, uh, how bad the virus was, how severe it was and um, how much to worry about it. Um, so we saw, of course, um, all of us on the news, we saw that the hospitals in Wuhan um, having quite a devastating time with um, many patients arriving with this unusual sort of pneumonia. Um, and we began to see cases appearing um, outside. Uh, these were the first um, cases confirmed in the UK um, in a hospital in a hotel in York um, that was in the news in January. Um, so really, the important question at the time was to work out how serious this virus was. Um, we saw a lockdown being um, put in place in Wuhan, uh, so we needed to know: did we also need to have a lockdown as well here? Um, so how do we start working out how serious a virus is? Um, so if we if we look at other viruses where people have done this kind of work before. Um, so at first people said, well, maybe it's just a bit like the flu that you know many of us get every year. Um, it's always circulating. Maybe it's not that different. So for seasonal flu, we think that roughly um, less than 0.1 percent of people will die if they catch the, the usual seasonal flu, which uh, works out to about one in a thousand or, or a bit less. Um, if we think back to some of the um, more serious pandemics in the past, so in the last century, um, as you'll have heard at the end of the First World War, there was the pandemic um, 1918 flu, which spread very quickly around the globe. Um, and we, although it was a long time ago, there are quite good data on that and lots of analysis has been done there. Um, so we think that that one had a much higher death rate, um, so about 1% to 1.5% of people who caught it would, would die. And uh, that was about obviously 1 in 100 or 1 in 150 um, or, or even a bit uh, more than that. So um, that was also an unusual epidemic in that that one particularly affected younger people, of course. So that was a little bit different from seasonal flu, which tends to affect older people more severely. Uh, I'll just try and move slides. Yeah, don't worry, Lucy, it's a bit sluggish. Yeah, OK. 
Did we have the answer to the to the Mentimeter question or is that coming up now? That's coming up, yes. Um, I'll just start talking a bit about the next slide. Um, so um, early in the epidemic, um, quite a lot of epidemiologists around the world got sent data from Wuhan. Um, so we had some data from hospitals in Wuhan where they were seeing patients arriving. And so that was one of the first uh, sources where we could start to work out how severe the virus was. Um, so when we first saw the data, we had um, the kind of data you get is not very, it's, it kind of sounds easy to work out how many people are dying from a virus, but actually when you see the data, you'll see why it's not as easy as it might sound. So um, in the data we saw in Wuhan, we found that about 10% um, of patients had died. Um, about 20% of the patients they'd had had recovered, um, but the rest of the patients were still in hospital at the time because this was very early on in the epidemic. Uh, so what does that mean in terms of the chance of dying of the virus? Um, so we could look at that data and say, well, 10% of these patients have died, so the death rate is 10%. Um, but of course, we don't know what's going to happen to the rest of the patients who are still in hospital, maybe um, some of those may have very serious illness as well. Um, we could just look at patients who um, have already got an outcome. So 30% of patients altogether have either died or recovered. And out of that 30%, 10% of those have died. And then we would get a one third um, death rate, which would be very much higher, of course. Um, so, and what other things do we need to consider? Um, well, I think it sounds from the Mentimeter, I think we uh, it looks like all of you know that the chance of dying of this virus is not 10 percent and it's not 30 percent. Um, and of course, one of the reasons for that is that if we look in hospital data, we're looking at the most severe cases and um, who do have um, some of the, the, the most serious outcomes and some of them do die in the end. Um, but of course, we now know more that there was transmission going on in the community at the time and there were lots of milder cases that were never picked up um, by the health system because um, there was no reason they'd be tested. Um, so how do we work out how many infections there are out in the community outside the hospital where um, we don't have as much data? Uh, so one thing we did have at the time was that um, you might remember that as the epidemic progressed in Wuhan, um, some countries flew home uh, people they had who, was, who were living in Wuhan. So they would repatriate, um, for example, diplomats or um, people working there um, who were from their country. Um, and to prevent spread of infection, um, everybody on board those flights, um, on, on board of many of the flights was tested. Uh, so at the time, that was the closest thing we had to um, a population survey telling us how many people really do have infection um, in a randomly selected group of people. Um, so when we looked at those data, we found that um, six of the people on uh, all of those flights put together were infected. Um, and that was out of about um, around 600 people. So we knew that at that point in time, 1% of everyone in Wuhan was um, was infected roughly. Um, of course, there it was quite a small data set, really. There was only six people there that were infected. So it was it was quite a huge uncertainty at the time, because if it had been only five or, or seven by chance, it would have made quite a difference to our calculation. And so when we factored that into account, um, it turned out that the final um, estimate of what the chances are of dying from the virus um, in Wuhan uh, were about 0.66%. Um, but there was a huge difference by age, which is something that has become much clearer over time as well. Um, so the chance of dying was much higher in, in older adults. Um, and so for that reason, um, we don't expect the chance of dying from the virus um, in the population as a whole to be exactly the same in different countries. Um, so countries which have older populations, on average, more elderly people um, will have um, more deaths from the virus. So if we translated our 
estimates of the fatality rate in Wuhan um, to what it would be in the UK, given the higher number of older people, it turns out to be about 0.9%, so quite a bit higher, nearly one in 100. Um, next slide, please. And now, of course, the virus has spread around the world um, and we're seeing uh, huge amounts of data coming out of different countries. Uh, the numbers you'll often hear on the news being reported are the total number of deaths um, that have happened in each country. And that what often hits the news is the number of countries that has the most deaths at a certain time. Um, this is a graph from a, a very interesting website called Our World in Data, which um, has some really interesting things on coronavirus if you're interested in looking at more uh, more statistics on it. Um, so you can see, as you, as you probably hear in the news, that United States and Brazil are really high up on that graph there in terms of the total number of deaths which have happened. And this graph is showing how the number of deaths happening over time uh, in total. And I've added the UK on there so that you can see where it is also pretty high up on the graph and um, together with Italy and Spain. Um, but of course, we know that the US is a, a much bigger country than the UK. Um, so is this really a fair comparison of um, how bad the epidemic is in different countries? And so there are other ways that you could look at these data. Um, if we look at the next slide, I think it's coming in a minute. Yeah, so the, the population of the United States is more than uh, 300 million, whereas the population of the UK is about um, 67 million. So even if the virus was spreading through um, the population in a similar way, we would expect to see more deaths in the US just because it's a bigger country. I think we're having a little bit of trouble with the connection now. Yeah, hi Sam, can you tell us, can, uh, we don't seem to be able to see um, Lucy's last slide. So this is where you're looking at, um, you're, you're sort of, you've changed the data to look per 100,000 people, is that right? Yes, yeah, so if we um, if we divide by the population size, if we divide the total number of deaths by the population size, we can get a little bit more of a fair comparison of countries in terms of what the death rate is per per hundred thousand people from the virus. Uh, so if we do it that way, then the countries are ordered in a slightly different way. So uh, the United States is no longer at the top of the graph. Um, in fact, uh, the UK becomes a bit higher than the, than the US um, and countries uh, like Belgium and Italy also very high up on that graph um, because they have very large epidemics and uh, not such big populations. Uh, the top of the graph, if you look per million, is actually San Marino, um, which doesn't doesn't tend to hit the news quite as much as the other countries. Hmm. And what? how does Brazil look? is still high it's just um, but it's underneath the UK and the US in terms of deaths per 100,000. What number is the UK at the moment? Um, the UK um, is um, yeah we're in a log plot so it's slightly different to difficult to read off the exact okay. number but it's around about um, roughly 700. No no I meant um, what are we the top of the chart in terms of um, oh not quite. No, we're high. We're high up there, and um, we're about approximately level with Italy, Andorra, uh, Belgium is higher, San Marino yeah. is higher. So, that, but I think the basic message here is that obviously, you know, when when people talk about the United States having um, so many cases, it makes sense because the of the population size, um, and so you have to do some way of of being able to compare properly between. Um, different countries and so if you express the um, fatality rate as the number of deaths per hundred thousand of the population um, it, it's it's 
then you get a different quite a different picture and actually yeah a worrying picture for us in the uk because we are um you know, you know our death rate is is high compared with places other places in the world um we're going to do some questions now um because there are loads of questions so margarita do you want to start um picking picking a question and asking uh whoever it is yeah sure um thank you for the presentation it was really nice and um it seems that a lot of people want to share their thoughts with you so i'm going to start with professor Riley, if it's okay for you sure um so uh first of all they're asking how do we estimate the infection fatality rate that even that would probably be better for lucy because she's that's what she's covered so do you mind if oh. i pass that one um yeah yeah uh, sure sure uh, lucy give a, uh, an answer to that yeah so there's two things we need to know for the infection fatality rate so one is um how many deaths we've seen from the virus um, and that of course in itself is not that easy to measure because um we need to be sure that we're testing everybody and uh, picking up all of those people if we have a reasonable number a reasonable um, figure on the number of deaths. Um, we also then need to know the total number of infections that have happened. Um, and that is probably the hardest <laughs> bit to know how many infections there really are in the community. Um, so at the moment, there's two ways of doing that. You can either go out and test a sample of people just randomly in the community, um, which is what we had on those repatriation flights from Wuhan. Um, or you can um, increasingly we're getting more data on antibodies, which we think is a reasonable way of finding out who's had the virus recently. And that also gives us some handle on how many people have had the infection in total. So then we take the total number of deaths and divide that by the total number of people infected to get our chance of dying from the virus. Um, do you think that the model based, uh, the model used was based on a previous influenza model? Um, can can that be used to estimate the behavior of a non-influenza virus? It's a really interesting question from Ronan. Should I take that? Yeah, go go for it. Um, so the, I think there is a bit of a perception that there is one model, um, and we use even just today we've talked about kind of projects that have used lots of different, you know. Um, analytical techniques or models if you like i think the one that has been uh, attracted a lot of publicity is a large simulation model that we used in in uh, in one of the reports and um, that was originally coded for flu and, and i think the short answer is that for um for certain questions it is a very good tool to use to look at sars-cov-2 um with the parameters adjusted accordingly um and it's a very useful tool because it's been kind of tested so much to, to think about flu planning it doesn't mean we can use that model for everything and we've only used it for, for a couple of hypotheses so for the right question um, I think it probably is reasonable um, to, to use models that were originally designed for another disease as long as they're kind of um, we put the best possible um, COVID parameters into it Good. Um, Professor Riley, do you think gaining herd immunity is an effective strategy for countries to use? Uh, so that's been a controversial topic in the UK. And I and I think other than a, a, a very short period of time in early March, I, I don't think anybody would call it a strategy as a consequence. So if lots of people get infected, then you will have people who are immune, at least for a period of time. Um, most countries including the uk are aggressively trying to reduce the number of people who get infected we want as few people to be infected as is possible we will still have some infections and that we will accumulate small amounts of population immunity which is herd, herd immunity is a is the proportion of population are protected so we will accumulate small amounts but it's it's in no way an objective it's a it's a consequence and it's and the objective as far as I can see is to reduce the number of infections to keep them as small as possible. Great so um, I assume that you believe that if the um, government have implemented lockdown earlier the R value would be a little bit 
less than it is today or it was back in March. Is that correct? Caroline, are you on? Are you answering that? I'd more than happy for you to jump in on that one. No. Sorry, could you repeat? Yeah, um, I was saying that, um, you know, a lot of students are asking that um, they believe that the government should have implemented lockdown earlier and that it would be beneficial as to reduce the, the R value. Uh, is that correct? Do you believe that it will help that? Uh, so I think in, in the UK, there was recently a, a meeting of scientists talking about the information they gave to government and they said that according to our models yes if you had locked down earlier we think it would have like saved more lives and this could have maybe meant fewer people were infected but what you've got to remember is that the disease epidemic it grows very 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 quickly okay so i think at the time they thought maybe every four days the number of cases was doubling and it gets big very quickly so the government have to take a lot of different things into account and they have to be careful about when they make these decisions. So whilst we can easily look back and say, yes, it might have been better had they done this a week earlier, back in March when those decisions were being made, like you, you don't you don't have that information. So uh, I think, yes, if we just look at numbers, it's very easy to say, oh, you could have done it earlier and it would have affected the numbers. But I don't think that's a fair indication about whether the decisions themselves were correct. Yeah, I agree with you. I know I'm trying to, to share the thoughts of our um, students here. So there's another interesting question. I think, Caroline, you're um, the best in that. Um, it says that, do you think that the UK government is testing enough people to be able to say for sure that the R number is dropping? Um, I think I'll actually might pass this to Stephen because he's done some work recently I'll on a project doing to that do wrong. with testing. No, it's fine. <laughs> Sorry I, for that. I know Stephen's done some work to do with um, this. So there's a there they, that that's they're all good questions. That's a really good question. It's not just the volume of testing; it's the type of testing as well. Um, and we are involved, um, actually, uh, Caroline as well, and, and a few others are involved in a project called React. Um, where along with a, a kind of sister project from the Office for National Statistics, we're randomly testing people. So we're, we're mailing out um, hundreds of thousands of requests for people to join our study, sending them a swab. They do a really good nose and throat swab, but they send it back to us. And then from this random sample, we can see who's got the virus and who's not. And that that's really going to help us going forward to get a clearer picture. The problem with the other data is it's all driven by an individual's probability of getting tested and that's affected by their age where they live their job and loads of other things so i think the government the, the government is making an awful lot of effort to get as much good data as they can um but it's it's not easy it, it's so, uh, so stephen can i just butt in on that um so you were saying about you're sending out these tests as somebody that i know said that they'd received one in the post um how many tests are you sending out we, in the first round, we sent out over 160,000 tests and we Yay. had and we got results from 120,620. So this yeah. is actually a good bit of citizen science, isn't it? It, it really is. And um, it, anyone watching this who gets something from the REACT study from Department of Health and Imperial College, please, please do join in. Um, you've got, You've got to watch the video, do the swab as well as you can. Um, and it is supposed to sting a little bit if you get it far enough in the nose. Yeah, I was going to say that because I know um, people have been saying that about doing the home testing, that actually you've got to do it. You've got to, yeah, stick it down, stick it up, you know, it's far enough, I guess. Um, and, and next round, we're going to go head to head with saliva. So that's kind of exciting. If people can okay. just spit into a little tube and we find that that's as good, then that will really help. Right. And do you have to fill out a um, uh, what's oh, consent form? Yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's research. We're, we're we're helping the government being funded by them, but it's an entirely it's a research project. So um, you receive a letter, you're asked to fill out a form online or to call a phone number and you consent to absolutely everything. And then the swab arrives and then. You OK, consent. now when you say you consent to absolutely everything, <laughs> um, 
I've just, the things I, that we do. I mean, because we're all familiar with sort of spitting in a tube and sending it away to various companies which will tell us about our DNA and, you know, whether or not we're going to get this disease or that disease or where we where our ancestors have come from. So tell me exactly what you're going to do with this sample and that you're not going to be, um, you know, looking at our, you know, sequencing our DNA or anything. So what we do, so we we ask for consent to um, to look for evidence of the virus um, in the sample that you send. And we ask for consent to, oops, sorry about that, to recontact you. Um, and whether in the future as a follow-up study, then we may ask to do subsequent things, but would recontact you before, uh, I believe before we uh, ask to do right. any things. But so it is, we're essentially recruiting, um, we're asking people to both provide us with a sample and to possibly be available for being recontacted again in the future. Yeah, so I guess so, for example, if I explain this to um, students, so for yesterday we were hearing about how um, the virus gains entry into um, cells through a specific protein on the surface of cells, and that's the ACE2 receptor. And so, for example, if um, we discovered that there were a subpopulation of people that had um, a slightly different um, sequence of their ACE2 receptor, which meant that they either were more susceptible, took up more virus or took up less virus. Um, the people doing these studies might want to then look, go back to people that had or hadn't got the virus and look at the um, sequence of that particular gene. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to uh, give you an imprecise answer, but I, I am sh there is the Possibility. There's, a, there's, a possibility. there's a possibility. There's a possibility that we made it, and I'm and I would have to check the exact consent that we've requested. But, uh, but I think the main, the main, the, the most important thing is to know that at the moment that that is absolutely not going to be happening. Um, and I know we've got loads more questions on here. So there's a few people asking things about dexamethasone. We've heard a lot about that in the news, and we are, we are going to have a session on the uh, pharmacology and all the drugs in a couple of weeks. So that will be um, right up to date. So we'll be covering that then. Um, and yeah, one one of the questions that um, came up, I can't find it now, it was about, was it Sweden or Switzerland somewhere Sweden. that has Sweden. Sweden? So yeah, tell us about Sweden. They've not had a lockdown. How um, did they do that then? Also, I'm happy to jump in unless, uh, do you want me to lead off Lucy and Caroline or do you want to jump in? I'm, I'm seeing nodding. Um, so the, the Sweden per capita death rate is actually quite high. So what they, what they chose to do was leave it to the people to decide their degree of social distancing. Um, and they, so they are having um, a relatively, compared to other countries that have done lockdown, they're having a relatively high per capita rate of death um, but the um, the population as you would expect have adjusted even without um, the the stringent direct interventions um, I'm not sure many people I'm not sure many people believe that London ever had that option I the, it's obviously an object a, a subject of some debate but the the speed and the and the and the early like in the global time scale london was infected quite early and it was the epidemic was doubling very aggressively so i think had had we chosen not um to go for lockdown i don't think there's any chance that the the profile of the epidemic in london especially with regard to saturating you know overwhelming the health service would have been anything like um and sweden has very high capacity for um intensive care and things like that so it's a it's not a straightforward story um but sweden is a is a different example and recently they have compared themselves to their kind of uh, nordic neighbors and said that they made a mistake so they have far more deaths and very very simple similar countries very close to them right wow. okay so there's um Yes, we're learning all the time and it's been a very uh, steep learning curve, hasn't it, through, through this whole sort of pandemic. Um, and uh, I think, it, you know, it is really exciting as a scientist to see that our um, data is being, you know, translated and we're being listened to and it's so um, valuable, I guess. Um, so 
thank you, Margarita, for um, tracking all those questions. Um, I'd really like to say thank you to obviously our speakers, Stephen, Carolyn and, and Lucy for their excellent talks today. Um, and thanks to Sam for producing. Next week we're going to be back. Um, we will be having uh, another lesson at two o'clock and we're going to hear from one of our scientists who's actually been spending her lockdown in one of the large uh, labs for Public Health England that has um, set up to actually test for the virus. And she's going to be telling you about the test, well, really about the science behind the test. So how does the test actually work? And she's going to be joined actually by a nurse. And this nurse actually works as a research nurse um, in the same group um, as Stephanie. And she's, I really wanted to, you to hear from her because I think she's doing an interesting job that I think most of you will not have heard um, about that sort of option or career path. So yeah, we're going to hear about research nurses. Um, Sam's just posted to say sorry for the sort of loss of um, the last uh, slides. We um, will be putting this up. Maybe we will um, ensure that that last slide goes up in the sort of revised um, version that we put online. Um, thank you all for joining us. Please um, fill in the survey that's in the chat at the moment just to um, tell us um, uh, about your sort of give us some feedback on the session. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and hope to catch up with you next week. So goodbye from all of us. <laughs>